Theodore Dalrymple uh, writing at europeanconservative.com. When faced with what appears to be a serious problem or threat, people can react in a number of ways. They can face it head on. They can deny it exists. They can claim the problem is no such thing, but rather a blessing. That's not a bug. That's a feature. They can be re- become resigned and apathetic, feeling there is nothing that they can do about it anyway, and they might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow they die. Uh, so <laughs> which is the approach that uh, Europe is taking when it comes to the multiculturalism that spawned mass migration that's changing the demographic? demography of Western Europe and uh, wonder if uh, Theodore Delrippel has any insights on what he's seeing from across the pond at, when it pertains to Biden policy, Biden's open borders policies here and these big cities that declare themselves welcoming uh, welcoming places uh, grappling with tens of thousands of migrants that have been sent up from border communities so that the big cities with their stylish viewpoints can live their values. Theodore Dalrymple is a contributing editor at City Journal, senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and the author of many books, including Life at the Bottom and Romancing Opiates. Theodore Dalrymple, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for asking me. So the, um, the popularity uh, of the essentially great replacement theory in Western Europe among the hoi polloi, but not among the vanguard class. Um, what, 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 give us, give us perspective on that in, in terms of, you know, possible applicability to our own plight here. Well, I mean, it's pretty self-evident in cities like uh, London and Paris that the nature, the, the demographic nature of the population has changed dramatically over the last uh, number of years. It's difficult to say exactly when it all started, but you have only to go on a train, uh, on a metro in Paris or uh, the underground in London uh, to see that it is not at all uh, the city it was demographically uh, uh, 50 years ago. Um, And in fact, you wouldn't know what country you were in, um, except that it must be a country like England or France, because there's no other place uh, where this a complete mixture goes on so that in a, in the metro for example i go in the metro in paris quite a lot um uh, you can see that uh, french people are now a minority and so the and and the response to this among the um well the the representatives of the people in public office and the uh elites and media and academia is the epicurean response well it's it's partly uh, that it's not happening or that it's a great blessing and one has to be nuanced about it because you know i know lots of um of people who've come from africa and elsewhere who are very good people so of course you can always cite uh, uh, good examples of integration and people being necessary to the functioning of the society for example my mother-in-law who lived in uh, Paris. She she needed carers for the last few years of her life, and all of them were either African or there was one Haitian, and there are no uh, Europeans at all to do that work. So there's a, a kind of benefit from it, or, or they are necessary. Uh, but on the other hand, when you see encampments of of migrants outside the Hotel de Ville, that's the uh, town hall or city hall of Paris, uh, you think this is dreadful. And what is going to happen, of course, one day, well, not not in the very distant future, it's going to be uh, when the Olympic Games start, these people are just going to be swept up and put somewhere else, uh, Manu Militari. No, no, nobody's going to be worried about their um, their human rights then. And uh, it, uh, the, the whole situation is tearing Europe apart. Orban, for example, in Hungary is refusing uh, to take his share of, of the refugees. But no one, or, or migrants, I should say, they're not refugees, they're migrants. Uh, no one, of course, is argue, uh, asking the migrants whether they actually want to go to Hungary. The idea of the Europeans is just to 
put a certain proportion of them in Hungary or wherever uh, without asking them whether they want to go. And this is this is a so-called liberal policy. And there's just not the, the, the enough uh, courage from those with platforms like we see in this country to say, look, this is not xenophobia and this is not about it being anti any particular persuasion of person, ethnicity, country of origin. It's about um, yeah, it's about sort of commonsensical rule of law when it comes to uh, allowing people into your country and um, the the sort of the the uh, processes and a cultural disposition to assimilation. I mean that yeah that that's so it. you're not allowed to you're not allowed to talk about that. Though it's perfectly obvious it's a question, and it's also perfectly it's not allowable to say in England. And I, I say this, all four, all four of my grandparents were refugees. My mother was a refugee. Her sister was a refugee twice in her life by the age of 42. So it's not that I'm against the idea of refugees. But nevertheless, the fact is that there isn't a single refugee arriving in those boats in England because international law says that a refugee should stay in the first country he arrives in uh, that is safe for him. And this cannot possibly be England coming by boat. I mean, right. France is not an unsafe country. So uh, nobody dares say this obvious thing, that there isn't a single refugee arriving like this. Mm. What about any Palestinian refugees? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, you mean, are there any, or yeah. what would one do if they came? No, are there? Well, I am sure there are. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there must be. Uh, what is rather alarming, of course, is that uh, uh, there have been demonstrations in favor of genocide in London and well, elsewhere, not only in London, but also in other parts of the world. Yeah, like Chicago. We're familiar with it. Um, the uh, been an interesting observation here, too, because we see this playing out with the migrants that have made their way to Chicago and the city and the county and the state trying to deal with this influx of people. Uh, you're right. The, the, um, the outcome of immigration sort of, of, of this particular view, the view of sort of, in our parlance, the proponent of sanctuary cities and states, the outcome, yeah. of, the outcome of immigration is determined solely by the conduct of the country that receives the immigrants, immigrants and not at all the unqualities, desires, or conduct of the immigrants themselves. Expound upon that. Well, the idea is that if if there's an unhappy outcome, it must be because uh, the receiving country is ungenerous, and nobody looks to disaggregate uh, the kind of um, uh, ethnic origins of or, or cultural origins of of uh, uh, immigrants and refugees, uh, and compare their uh, their success. And, and it's perfectly obvious that in that in a country like France, which has 800,000 Chinese people, for example, um, what actually happens to migrants and refugees depends very much on the kind of people they were when they arrived. And it's a kind of, um, uh, how can I say, arrogance to suppose that the only thing that affects outcome is what we, that is to say, the receiving people, do. Well, right. I mean, but that's the left's posture towards all the people that they make their mascots, right? The, that, uh, uh, yeah. You know, the, yeah. Yeah. So, so th this, is, um, uh, this is sort of the, the, the 21st century white man's burden uh, approach to uh, policymaking. And it's uh, extremely arrogant, actually. It, it's us and the rest. We are truly human. They are not human. They don't make decisions. They don't have prejudices. They don't have any cultural characteristics. They are just putty in our hands. Yeah. And if it turns out badly, then it must be our fault. Yeah, I know. Uh, we see it. We see it with minorities in this country. I mean, it's the same approach that the uh, rich left uh, has with the. Uh, uh, blacks or uh, Latinos in inner cities. These are magical people. They're our mascots. Uh, as you say, they have no agency. 
we are here to provide for them from a distance, from, from, from a, keep your distance, um, provide for them as, so that we can put signs up in our yards that tell everybody what a good person we are. Same thing in Western Europe, right? Yes, yeah. yeah it's a, essentially the same thing, yeah. And it's a kind of feeling of omnipotence, actually, and omniscience. Um, it's, it's, it's ironic how many people feel omnipotent and omniscious and are functionally illiterate. Uh, you've uh, uh, written about uh, what's happening in the UK with respect to all the money invested in primary and secondary education, and you've got uh, one in six or seven of the adult population that is characterized as functionally illiterate. Uh, and the response, of course, because we're very familiar with that concept of uh, education as well, the, the the response here is, for example, listen to this, get your reaction, and you can uh, provide some British color to it. But the Chicago Public Schools, their um, admissions test for the selective enrollment schools, why aren't all the uh, schools selective enrollment? Great question for another time. But anyway, the test for the selective enrollment schools has been reduced this year from two and a half hours to one hour in order to reduce anxiety for students. Oh my God. We recognize the stress many students and families experience when it comes to admissions testing. So uh, we're going to arbitrarily cut the time of the test by more than half in order to reduce stress and anxiety. There, there's, there's rarely ever any reference to uh, testing somebody's intellectual capacities, developing people's intellectual capacities, particular skill sets that you learn at the K through 12 level in government schools in Chicagoland and in other big metropolitan areas. It's always about anxiety and stress and accessibility and so on and so forth. It's never about performance, uh, retention, skill development, intellectual capacity, promises for success. It, that's not, uh, I assume, something you're unfamiliar with. No, well, no. I mean, I, I can give a, a small graphic example when I'm asked to write an article. If I weren't given a deadline, um, I would never write it. Uh, but nevertheless, as the deadline approaches and I still haven't done anything, uh, my level of anxiety uh, increases. So uh, does that mean that I shouldn't have been given a, um, a deadline? Of course not. And um, this is, a, this is a, I'm afraid uh, this is one of the consequences of the psychologization of life, if I can put it like this. I mean, Shakespeare said the first thing we should do is kill all the lawyers. Well, I think the, f <laughs> the second thing we should do is kill all the uh, psychologists. <laughs> I mean this metaphorically, of course. Of course. But psychology, the study of psychology has been a disaster for civilization. Uh, I wanted to get uh, to one more fun piece you wrote before we uh, have to let you go, um, and that is about uh, obesity in Britain. This is a particular uh, topic of importance to my colleague here, Amy. I'm uh, not a fattest. Thank uh, you. No, okay. Yeah, exactly. So that's a qualification you need to, to make before you're allowed to talk about this. But um, I, I just love the the distillation of uh, the popularity of Ozempic. This, uh, I, I guess it's turned into some sort of... Uh, Skinny Wait, people are taking yeah, it weight too, loss, man. weight loss drug. Oh yeah, but um, the, the description of Ozempic as serving people living with the over, living with overweight or living with obesity, living with obesity. I just talk about uh, uh, your reaction to that characterization. Well, of course, that is now the term of art in medical uh, journals, I suppose. Uh, you know, uh, criminals live with burglary. Or, or... <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, uh, it, it, it's beyond satire, actually. And it's very dangerous to satirize anything because if you satirize something, you'll find that within uh, a few months, it's actually official policy. <laughs> uh, and, and then the, the whole development, too, the zeitgeist behind Ozempic now, but to the extent that yeah. uh, there are bad outcomes, we, we know how this plays out. And it's not going oh. to be culpability uh, of those who uh, ran headlong into the magic pill that's going to take away their uh, responsibility Fatness. to have yeah. to do anything. I mean, I think the fundamental problem is that we, we think that if we give agency to people, 
then when things turn out badly for them, we're, we're actually so hating them that we don't want them to darken our door again. So you're either a complete innocent or a complete, completely guilty person. And of course, most of us are somewhere in between the two. Theodore Dalrymple, by the way, uh, yeah, bel- happy birthday. Belated, belated yes. happy birthday yesterday. Yeah. Thank you very much. A contrib- you. Contributing editor to City Journal, senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, author of many books, including Life at the Bottom and Romancing Opiates. Theodore Dalrymple, thank you as always. Thank you. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer lines. Listen to Dan and Amy on your smartphone. Download the AM560 mobile app today at 560theanswer.com slash mobile. Well, they dropped it down the stairs and then they tumbled off their truck. But when it fell out in the street, I knew I was out of luck. I got the crash, bang, boom, should have had it in the staircase blue.